Good morning. It's good to have you here at Granada to worship God. And I just want to spend a little bit of time in prayer before we look at the text for today. And we usually in this service spend a few moments in a prayer of confession. And I want to do that this morning. Our hearts need to get to that place. So let's pray together. Father, somehow right now we've given fear the megaphone, the microphone. We've given it voice. Lord, you know how it can rule in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, so we confess that it's easier to turn to fear than it is to turn to you. And this morning as we worship, Lord, we bring all of that to you in really the most honest way. Your word tells us that there are times when we don't even know what to pray. And Lord, I, I'm, I'm there. And Father, I think all of us are there. And so we simply bring ourselves into your presence in our need and in our hunger for hope and life. And we wait upon you. Lord, we know waiting means, it means trusting. It also means hoping. And so we do that today, Lord. We focus our hope, our trust, our lives to you, knowing that Jesus has come and and knowing the events of this week in our world when Jesus went to the cross on our behalf, that um, the darkness of this week was dispelled by a light that shone forth from an empty tomb. And so, Lord, lead us on that journey where we can see and live and walk in that light For we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. Now, it happens that um, a few months ago, I planned this Easter series, the three services, Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, and Easter on the theme of power for the powerless. It's before all of this happened. And so I think it's not by coincidence that God wants us to think about this, to focus on His Word. So I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2, just a few short verses. I'll pray and we'll jump in together. This is the Word of God. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, all that we bring to you this morning, uh, be received in your sight because Jesus is our Redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. After a wealth of caution and getting the best sort of advice, uh, my two sons and I set off on the adventure of our lives. We've been planning for this for almost five years. Maybe you've heard part of this story. We went to Peru and we spent a few days before March 16th when in the evening hours we were packing up all of our stuff in our backpacks and we, were, we met with our guide to take the four-day trek on the Inca Trail. It's an amazing trail. The ancient Incans built this trail in the 1300s or 1400s and it ends in this place called Machu Picchu. It crosses the highest elevation is 14,000 feet. And so that night we were so excited. We made sure our bags, our, our backpacks were all ready and so much so that we could hardly rest that night. The thing is we woke up the next morning and our guide was nowhere to be found. Soon we were told the national parks were all closed and our adventure had been canceled. But what was worse was that the president of Peru was closing the borders that day. 
we would be stuck in Peru. Now, of course, we rushed to the airport as fast as we could to change our flights, but there we discovered there were thousands of other people all at once trying to get out of the country before the lockdown. It was impossible. There was no getting out that day. We were in Peru for days. Then a week passed. We were heading toward two weeks, quarantined in our hotel, and there was no sign that we could get home. Days on end, the airport was closed. And actually, I noticed that the first booking for commercial travel was pushed to May 6th. Now, as a father, I felt angry that no way had been made for people like us to get home. But in truth, I was also afraid. I felt responsible for the health of my sons. If, if one of us got sick here, so far from home and from quality health care, what would we do? And what about our wives and our family? Who would be there to support them if one of them became sick? In short, I felt small and I felt helpless. I think all of us know this feeling now. I think there was a time when we felt big and powerful and we could go wherever we wanted and in control of our circumstances, but not now. We know what it means to feel powerless. We're afraid now. We're afraid of where all of this is going, where, where our lives are headed. We don't know what the future will look like. We're afraid someone we love will become sick. We're traumatized by the news broadcasts, but somehow we're still drawn to watch them. Now, some of us have had experiences of this kind of powerlessness before. It's not new to you. Maybe it was when a relationship was disintegrating and nothing you did could help. Or you had a sickness with healing that, that just wouldn't come or maybe you lost a livelihood, a job, and it left you in, in free fall. You were floating on a sea of uncertainty. It all felt so beyond your control. There were just days left before you knew you couldn't pay your bills. You see, we traffic in control and power. And, and what do we do when it's gone? Nietzsche, the German atheistic philosopher, said this. He said, I teach no to all that makes weak, that exhausts. I teach yes to all that strengthens. Everything done in weakness fails. We believe this. Our lives are about strength and accomplishments. We, we love to win and we hate weakness. And there just is no room for a time like this. We had plans in truth, we made every attempt to make ourselves powerful and invincible. And we, and we do this with our technology and our resources, and in a myriad of ways, this is our goal. So yes, we, we hide our weaknesses. We don't want to speak about our fears or our losses. And then we see Jesus. He had all power. He's God, for goodness sakes. But we are told about Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather, it's like this, he made himself nothing. Really? He had strength and he laid it aside? He didn't use his strength? He made himself weak? Why would he do this? And that is what I want to look at with you today. Why Jesus made himself weak. Now, the readings that we've heard tell us the story of what happened. It's, it's Palm Sunday, and we call it the triumphal entry of Jesus. But, but it's anything but that. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and he's, he's welcomed as a king, but, but he's riding a donkey, and everything about this moment just speaks of weakness. Yes, I know the crowds praise him, but those in authority are plotting to take his life. And even that crowd is going to turn against him. By Friday, they'll be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Their, their praise is so shallow and only in this moment. But I wonder, why didn't Jesus assert himself? Why not show his power? Why not force them to follow him? I think he came in weakness 
First to identify with us in every way. He didn't exempt himself from human suffering when he entered into our world. He didn't, he didn't take a pass on pain or loss. You know, I've heard some people are trying to do that in this epidemic. That they can afford to fly on private jets to private islands or to specially prepared disaster bunkers. They're even taking doctors and medical personnel with them just in case they get sick. Some have been able to arrange tests when the tests were not available for us. By the way, I understand the desire for safety. Let me tell you, I would have loved to have been flown out of Peru on a private jet and, and airlifted to safety. But notice Jesus. He could turn around and not go to Jerusalem. He's heading toward mistreatment and death. Why is he doing this? Well, we're told this. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Why does Jesus embrace weakness? To be where we are. This, this is where we live every day. Most days we can't see it and we, and we won't admit it. And we manage to keep the fears at bay. But we're feeling vulnerable now. I think our views of God is that He's far away and, and He doesn't know what we're going through. He couldn't possibly understand. But Jesus is God with us to share in our weakness. Listen to one of our poets the other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Do you know that Jesus has wounds too? He knows our pain. Death was always at hand. He, he knows. I think one part of my experience of being a father and, and being in such uncertainty, wanting to protect and to bring to safety to be able to do anything was this feeling that nobody could understand what I felt. The book of Proverbs says, each heart knows its own bitterness and no one can share its joy. In other words, the deepest feelings that we experience, no one can really know them. There's a, a loneliness and fear and in weakness, and, and we instinctively want to say, you, you couldn't possibly understand. But here's Jesus, and He knows. He became weak to share in our broken humanity. But you know, there's more going on in this scene. This is a place where Jesus is not only coming in weakness, but he's also revealing the nature of his kingdom. That day on Palm Sunday, the scene reeks of weakness. L let me tell you why. The Romans know all about royal processions, and this is exactly how one would look. The conquering general enters into the big city like this, and he's on a chariot gleaming with gold. And thousands are alongside of him. And stallions are straining at the reins and wheel spikes flashing in the sunlight. And, and the crowd just has feelings of awe and submission. And behind the general are the soldiers and they're carrying on their standards the banners of those people that have been conquered and the of the defeated armies. And then at the end of the procession comes a, a ragtag group of slaves and prisoners who are in chains. They've been captured and subdued, and they are living proof to the power of Rome and that general. But the Gospels don't tell us of a scene like that. With Jesus are children, the sick, the lame. There's no chariot, there are no weapons, no soldiers, no captives. These are only pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. This isn't a victory march. It's a picture of Jesus' kingdom. It's not about his strength. And, and this is a way when I read it, I think we just don't know. So Jesus describes it later to his disciples like this. The kings of the Gentiles or of the nations exercise lordship over their people and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. 
Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom. Jesus says, my kingdom isn't like the other nations. It's not about force. Theirs is. Theirs is about power and rule, but mine is about service. Theirs is about self-empowerment. Mine is about self-emptying and self-expenditure. You see, you think the enduring kingdom is about being strong and well-connected, but let me tell you, you cannot power through what is happening right now. Power won't solve this, but love and sacrifice will. And that's what my Father's kingdom is made up, is all about. It's made up of people you would reject. People that don't look perfect, but they are loved by me. And when I see Jesus here, I think, this is so radical. I, I can't get my mind around this. A completely alternate kingdom. And then you begin to see history unfold in this alternate kingdom in action. It happened when plagues then rippled through the Roman Empire. After Jesus' resurrection, people ran for their lives, even leaving behind sick relatives. But something remarkable happened. Christians stayed in the stricken cities giving care to the sick and nourishment to the dying. And here was this kingdom of Jesus about serving the desperate. You know, historians look at this and say, this is why the Christian faith spread so rapidly. It was because of such love and service. It was Jesus' alternate kingdom. As the old hymn says, For not with swords loud clashing or roll of stirring drum, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. As I read this and think about this, we need this kingdom right now. You say, well, what does it look like? Loving service means giving resources or supplies you may rather keep for yourself to someone else. Taking food to a neighbor that cannot leave the house. Stepping forward to protect someone that needs protecting, even though that might leave you feeling more exposed or vulnerable. For example, one medical worker in our church has volunteered to serve on a coronavirus floor in the hospital. But all of us can find a way to serve. Maybe it's giving financially so that you can make sure that other people with needs, that those are met. And this is how people will be able to see the alternate kingdom of Jesus. My sons and I saw this in our little hotel as, as each day the staff, I'm sure, wanted to stay home, but they showed up to make sure we had food and were safe. And many rallied to secure our travel home. Many others prayed and encouraged us when we felt down and alone. And, and we just saw the sacrificial nature of the kingdom of Jesus. I think about it today, and I think across the third world, needs are quickly outstripping resources, and we need to be thinking and praying about what we can do to love those who have far greater needs and fewer resources than we do. Now, why would we do this? Jesus entrusted this kingdom, his kingdom to us. But there's more. Jesus also made himself weak, not just to identify with us and to teach us about his kingdom, but to teach us to rely on God. And I think there's a tectonic shift that takes place when this happens. And it really prepares our hearts for the gospel. And here's why. Because we don't get to God. We don't receive life and forgiveness through our strength and our achievement. We have to receive it as a gift. It's not about winning. It's really about losing. That's how Jesus described it. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his, his soul? Jesus says your life, your very soul is at stake. And you're trying to be strong. You want to win but you only come to my kingdom by losing because it is here you learn to rely on God. In fact, your spiritual bankruptcy 
The fact that you are poor in spirit is the greatest thing you have going for you. Your successes, all the blue ribbons and trophies you have, they won't get you home. Only God can do that. You see, we don't want to lose this identity that we have grounded in our accomplishments and and resources, our achievements. But this is the only way we can be found in Christ. It's when we come to rely on God. And, And this is the heart of the gospel. We can't do it. We cannot fix ourselves and our world. We need God and His love to rescue us. His faithfulness to sustain us and protect us. You know, Nietzsche was wrong. Anything done trusting human strength apart from God is going to fail. Only the kind of weakness that forces us to rush to God offers any hope. I know our human response is be strong. You can do it. Rely on yourself. But the gospel says be weak. There you will meet the God that can do all things. Lately, I've been reading Doris Goodwin's marvelous book on four presidents called Leadership in Turbulent Times. It's about Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, and Lyndon Johnson. She points out that every one of these presidents passed on a course through loss and weakness. I only share one of their stories. Teddy Roosevelt was only 26 years old and he was serving in the New York State Assembly in Albany when he received a telegram telling him that his first child has been born. You could imagine the joy. His wife was in New York, but shortly afterward, he received a second telegram and the news took his breath away. He caught the first train and arrived to find family that had come to welcome the baby But instead, he realized that his mother was dying. The next hour, he was plunged into a nightmare of grief. By the way, his mother was only 49 years old. They thought she had a cold, but she had typhoid. And he was at her bedside at 3 a.m. in the morning when she died. And then 12 hours later, he held his beautiful young wife, who had just given birth, in his arms as she died of kidney failure. That night, he lost two of the most important people in his life, and he put a large black X in his diary and wrote, the light has gone out of my life. Do you know that this is the sort of loss that filled Palm Sunday? That as Jesus rode into Jerusalem and the city came into view, he knew what was going to happen to the city. It would be totally lost And he wept. I wonder today, have you wept yet? Have you wept over what you've lost? And what is happening in our world? What our world has lost? Have you wept over the things that you know are gone and in a future you don't you can't understand what will happen? You know, it's it's okay. Jesus wept. And this is a good place for us because this is a place where we can come to rely on God. You see, Jesus made himself weak so that we might learn that we, know, we need God. And finally, he made himself weak to give power to the powerless. So Jesus opens the way to God in his weakness, and there's a new sort of power for the powerless. It seems like a loss to us, but we're given a new identity as beloved by God, a new freedom from death's power to control us and and keep us afraid, and and a new joy in in the midst of the storm because we know, as Scripture teaches, if God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Isn't that beautiful? If Jesus came in such weakness and and God gave his son on our behalf, of course he is for us. For days down in Peru, I felt the heaviness of being responsible for more than I could carry. The truth is I was powerless, and it was as I came to see this, God came more clearly 
into view. There was a power in this powerless. I couldn't bring us home. And none of the people I reached out to could do it either. There was only God and His grace and His provision. We ended up entering America by sheer grace on a flight we weren't booked on with plans none of us were, were able to arrange. And, and here we are, happy to be back home. You see, we, we are not in control. We, we are weak. But God has this. He has it all in hand. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Jeff last week preached on not wasting your corona And this is a time we can use to draw closer to God, to to look to Him and celebrate the power of the powerless found in our weakness. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that He may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. So what do you do this day? Maybe this is the day when you weep, when you you start to get honest about how powerless you feel. It it was for Jesus. And that's okay to realize the disappointment. It's okay to express this. And hopefully that will be the moment when you run to Jesus. You see God as your help and shield, an ever-present refuge in times of trouble. And there's power that's found not in us, but in Him, for you can rely on God. Father, thank You for worship. Thank You for showing Jesus who had all things in His hand, but emptied Himself, taking the very nature of a servant, really making Himself nothing, so that we might know that we're not alone. You know what we're feeling and enduring what we're living But even more, we can rely on you and your grace. And Father, thank you that that's the gospel. That it's not about us being strong enough or worthy enough or perfect enough or figuring it all out. It's about the great truth that you've loved us in Jesus. And we thank you and pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.